So for the last few weeks, we've been talking about what the Bible calls the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus' kingdom. We've been learning about how it's not off in the future. It's right here, right now. We've been learning how it's not talking about when we go to heaven. That is in the future for everybody in this room. Um, It's a completely different concept than a lot of us, myself included, understood it to be for most of my life. We've been seeing how we confuse it with our salvation. And when the Bible talks about the kingdom of God, we assume that it's talking about whether or not we're even born again. And I've heard people all my life say, well, the Bible says that if you do anything like this, you're not going to heaven. And when you read it, that's not what the Bible says. I've joked with you before about when I was a kid, the unpardonable sin was smoking. If you saw someone smoking, not only did they smell like they were from hell, That's where they were going. And I can remember being in junior high and having it occur to me that the Bible says nothing about it. It's just church people didn't like it. And so the concept of the kingdom of God has really been manipulated, misused, misunderstood, And we've been going into some detail about what it is, why it matters, how it affects us. And the verse we keep going back to is 1 Corinthians 4.20, where the Apostle Paul says the kingdom of God is not just fancy talk. It is living by God's power. And by the way, remember the word living is a present tense word. That means it is about what we're doing right now. I can look off in the distance to heaven and think about how nice it's going to be and be an absolute jerk down here. I know no one here has ever met a jerk in church. And no one here has ever been a jerk in church. But that's not what Paul talks about. He says it's about living by God's power. Now, I'm going to change gears a bit today, and I'm going to ask an interesting question. Well, it's interesting to me. Since we know that Jesus is the king of God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, how different from other kingdoms is the kingdom of God from kingdoms we've experienced. How is the kingdom of God different from other kingdoms? Now, the concept of a kingdom is something that we Americans haven't been too familiar with. For 245 years, we've intentionally not been a kingdom. And part of me is very happy about that. That means I don't have any royal pinheads that I have to pay attention to. I don't have to deal with any of that stuff because we were given what's called a representative republic. And according to the founding documents of our country, the purpose of our government is to support the people and protect their God-given rights. That's the reason it exists. That is not a kingdom. Interestingly enough, we learned that when God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt, he used a guy named Moses. He sent Moses in there to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I don't know how he said, let my people go. Most of us, after a certain age, are picturing and hearing Charlton Heston. I'm always concerned that when I meet these people in heaven, they're not going to sound like what I want them to sound like. When I get to heaven 
and I get to actually audibly hear God speak, it really needs to be James Earl Jones. (laughs) And I want him to look at me and say, I am your father. (laughs) I don't want him to be Fran Drescher. (laughs) When I get to hear Moses speak, I know what I want him to sound like. Now the problem is, just occurs to me, I'm not going to understand what he says because he's going to be speaking Hebrew. Of course he will. But he goes up to Pharaoh and says, God says, let his people go. I don't know that he yelled at Pharaoh. I don't know that he tried to intimidate Pharaoh. I don't know if he himself was a little intimidated. I don't have any idea. But God sent Moses in there, said, let my people go. Pharaoh laughed at him. So God says, oh, you're not taking me seriously? Folks, take God seriously. What happens to us when we don't take God seriously is not always fun. We're going to find that out in just a minute. God led his people out of Egypt. His point was to have the kind of relationship with them that he had with Abraham. We learned that all he wanted from his people was for them to trust and follow him. It's not complicated. Did it ever occur to you that Abraham did not have a Bible? Abraham went home to Sarah and said, we're going to pack everything up, our thousands of animals, our hundreds of family members and servants, all of our stuff, and we're moving. And Sarah says, where are we moving? And Abraham says, I don't know. Why are we doing such a stupid thing? Because God told me to. You and I have the benefit of having a Bible to go back and kind of confirm whether or not we might have heard from God. Abraham simply had to trust God. And that's what God wanted from his people. His people didn't want that. And it didn't take them long at all to say, listen, Just give us a set of rules that we can follow. We don't want to deal with you. You're scary. I'm serious. And so God called Moses up to Mount Sinai and gave him a set of rules. He wanted to run the entire human race on 10 rules. Can you imagine the state of California trying to run anything on 10 rules? Ten rules. And he gave them to Moses. And we're not spending a lot of time in this story, but Moses came down, presented them to the people. They said, yay, we'll follow all of these. Oh, wait, what's going on now? It lasted about a minute and a half. And they started resenting the rules. And they started wondering what God was saying to them. But they told Moses, by the way, we don't want to hear from God. We want you to go talk to God and then come back and tell us what he said. Because God is intimidating. You, you're just Moses. So God's people don't want to trust him and follow him. They don't want to hear from him. So God talked to them through Moses. He invented the office of prophet. Because God's people didn't even want to hear from him. And they established the office of prophet. And through the Old Testament, there you can follow the chronology of the different prophets that God used to speak to his people. Why? Because they did not want to hear from him. I, I, I want to set the context of what we're going to look at here.
Let's see. What I wrote was pretty good, but I just kind of got off track. It says they wanted rules to follow so they wouldn't have to deal with God personally. He gave them the Ten Commandments. He wanted to talk to them. They wanted Moses to talk with God and then tell them what he said so they wouldn't have to deal with God personally. He gave them what became known as prophets. A gentleman named Samuel was one of the prophets. He's got a very interesting story, but we don't have time to get into it right now. And the people had to go to him to find out what God was saying. So we can read this. The Old Testament book of 1 Samuel in chapter 8, starting in verse 1, says as Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father. They were greedy for money. They accepted bribes. They perverted justice. Yes, even thousands of years ago, when justice is perverted, it ticks people off. We all have a very well-developed sense of what is fair. Verses 4 and 5 says, Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. You remember when you were a kid and one of your friends had something that you wanted? You realize that's what our entire economy is based on? Oh man, we feel horrible if other people have things we don't have. Give us a king like the other nations have. Who was their king? Who was God's people's king? God. But God, we don't want you as our king. We want a king like all of the other nations have. You know, the quicker we understand that what God has for us is best, the better off we're going to be. The quicker we understand that the way God wants us to live, the things he wants for us, is what's best for us, the better off we're going to be. Think about all the new ideas that we've fallen for over the years that simply took us away from what God wanted. And then we find out, well, son of a gun, that didn't work out so well for us. I remember watching a special, I love history, I love historical documentaries, and it was on the people in the 60s. I remember the 60s. I was a kid, but I remember them. And they were talking about how they were throwing off the shackles of Western society, and they wanted to be free to live their lives the way they wanted, and they didn't want to be married for a while. And they didn't want to have to stay married. And they talked about how free the people were in the late 60s and the 70s when the divorce rate started to skyrocket. And then they said, yeah, we did find out later that it was incredibly destructive to children. And I looked at it and I thought, duh. How stupid are you people that someone had to show that to you? You should have known that on your own. Oh, we think people are feeling bad because they get wrong answers in math. So let's make it to where there are no wrong answers in math. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the accountant I want to go to. How much did you make last year, Mr. Kreitz? How much are your deductions? More than your income? Sure. That's a bad idea. But people are going to try it. I want to make sure they're not designing any of the bridges I drive across. I understand mechanical engineering. And math answers are important. 
We don't want to rely on God to lead us. We want what all the other nations have. And of course, they're not paying attention to what's going on in the other nations. I hear people say that now. But our government's not like the ones in Europe. And I go, are you even paying attention to what goes on everywhere else in the world? We don't change, folks. People do the same dumb things over and over and over again. Look at how Samuel reacts. It says, Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. When I'm displeased, I shouldn't complain about it. I should go to the Lord for guidance. Have you ever been really ticked off about something and God said, don't worry about it. Isn't that frustrating? There's an Old Testament word in the King James that I love. And I want God to smite them. <laughs> and he says, eh, don't worry about it. There was a thing I read on Facebook earlier this week. Ticked me off. And I sat there with my fingers above my keyboard. Inappropriate finger placing style from typing class in 1977. And I'm all ready to go. And God said, don't do that. But they're wrong. Don't do that. We need to go to God for guidance. God says, do everything they say to you, for they are rejecting me, not you. They do not want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. Notice little g gods. And now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask. Now, folks, when we go to God with a request, what is that called? Prayer. Do you realize all God did was answered their prayer and said yes? Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. God says, let them have what they want, but give them a heads up about what's coming. God basically says, this is a bad decision. But if you don't want to live in my kingdom anymore, you don't have to. But here's what's going to happen. Then he says this through Samuel, the prophet they demanded because they didn't want to deal with him personally. He says in verse 10, so Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons, assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to sow in his fields and harvest his crops. Some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves. Give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. Wow. 
when that day comes, <laughs> you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. And the Lord will not help you. Not everything in the Bible is rainbows and unicorns. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king that you are demanding, but the Lord will not help you. Over the last year and a half or so, I've heard lots and lots of Christians complain about actions that the government has taken. And how long is God going to let this continue? And I've been very unpopular with a lot of people because I'm saying God is not responsible for any of this. Who chose these people? We did. I didn't. Yes, we did. And so when we complain about what's happening, who is the complaint aimed at? The people who made the choice. Samuel told them, this is going to happen. Everything in this kingdom is going to be used for the king's personal desires, including everything you think is yours. And that's what you're demanding. Is that the way God treats his people? No. It makes some people a little uneasy, but when you look at it, God doesn't make people do anything. He has never made you do a thing in your life. He's guided you. He's given you wisdom. Through other members of his body, he's given you counsel, but the choices are yours. And in his mercy, when I've made bad choices, he's led me out of a lot of those bad choices. But we think, why do we have to suffer the consequences? Because we did it. And what really sets off our fairness alarms is when other people's bad choices cause us bad consequences. but our lives are all intertwined. If someone runs a red light and hits my car, I'm suffering because of their poor choices. Well, that's not fair. As I can still hear in my head in my father's voice, son, who told you the world was fair? You will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but the Lord will not help you. This is where the nation of Israel says, boy, did you save us from making a dumb mistake. Thank you for warning me. Oh, wait, no, they didn't. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king. Yeah, everything you're saying is probably right. We still want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. We want it, we want it, we want it, we want it. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. We don't want God to judge us and lead us. There are times when I read the Bible and just put my head in my hands and say, dear God, how many times have I done exactly that? So Samuel reported to the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord replied, do as they say, 
give him a king. Samuel agreed and sent the people home. As you read through the Old Testament and you read about the horrific things some of these kings did, the suffering that the people endured because of what the king did, the misery that entire nations lived in because of what the king did. Don't ask, why does God let this happen? The question is, why did we demand this? When you study human history, you find out that this is not the way that the kings behaved is not unusual. I was watching a show on Henry VIII in England and how because his good religious wife was not bearing him the proper heirs for the throne, he wanted to marry someone else. But the Pope wouldn't let him divorce her. So he simply started his own church that he was the head of. And since he's the head of it, he gets to decide who he gets to sleep with. How convenient! We've made these decisions all through human history. And and the part that bugs me is we have blamed God for so many things that we did. Rhonda and I watch a lot of TV shows on home decorating and home repair and home renovation and all that stuff. And I love listening to people who do something and then say, oh, this just happened. I was watching one this morning before church and there was this little stained glass window at the landing on a set of stairs that had been broken out. And the guy said, yeah, some buddies and mine, we were moving a couch upstairs and the window broke. (laughs) And I hate to admit to being that crusty old guy, but I thought, you immature piece of... The window didn't break. You broke it. But we are much more comfortable with, oh gosh, that just happened. Oops. And then if you're kind of religious or mad at God, you'll say, why did God allow this? (laughs) We did it! That's what we talked about last week. A lot of times we have given the devil permission to attack us by the choices we've made, by the decisions we've made. We have given him the foothold because Jesus gave us authority to overcome him. It's not God's fault. That's how kingdoms work. Everything is for the king. Everything is owned by the king. I can remember the Bugs Bunny cartoon when one of the earls in England gets lied to by Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny shows him what a wonderful piece of property this is. Maybe you should build a house here. (laughs) What's in the king's forest? He'll never know. Well, all the land belongs to the king. All of the trees in the land belong to the king. All of the animals in the trees in the land belong to the king. And if anybody does anything that the king doesn't want them to do, they are in trouble legally. The kingdoms exist on earth for the benefit of the king. But that's not fair to me. You're not the king. (laughs) 
But God, that's not fair to me. Well, Mike, you're not the king. You're just the guy that demanded the king. You didn't want me to be your king. Now, it's interesting how Jesus describes how kingdoms work. Not how his kingdom works, but how kingdoms work. Jesus has a lot to say about this. Today, we're just going to look at one subject. And it was brought on by a mother's ambitions for her sons. In Matthew chapter 20, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, and she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? Jesus asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right side, one on your left. Respectfully, in your kingdom. My boys are special. They should be numbers two and three in your kingdom. Don't you agree? Now, I would like to think that her sons are going, Mom! But that's not the impression we get at all. Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Jesus knew he was soon going to be put to death. And he'd talk to them about it, but no one in his group of followers was paying close enough attention to realize what he was saying. Jesus says, I'm about ready to go through a really, really rough time. Are you going to be able to go through that with me? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. <laughs> One of the reasons I am confident in the truth of the scriptures is they do not make anybody look good. These guys were morons. They did exactly what I would have done. <laughs> Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. You know how many of Jesus' disciples lived to a nice, healthy old age? John the Beloved died in prison on an island and was left there and he died of old age in chains. Every other one of his disciples was put to death. Now, after the Holy Spirit got done with them, they had no problems with that fate. In fact, they were concerned that they were not worthy to suffer the way Jesus suffered. But Jesus knew what was coming. But then Jesus says, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. The Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. So Jesus did what every good manager does. Bumped it upstairs. <laughs> when the other 10 disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. Why? Because they didn't think of it first. <laughs> they wanted to be on Jesus' right and left. When Jesus called them together, he said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. When arbitrary rules are set down and somebody has the audacity to say, but why? It's a problem when the people in the government say, because I said so, shut up. 
But folks, I have heard a lot of that in the last year and a half. In our world, we like to have authority over other people. We want to have control over other people. It's not enough to try and live my life the way it should be lived. I want to make sure you're living your life the way I think it should be lived. There are so many ways we could go in, in this area, but our world runs on inappropriate authority. Who is it God wanted us to follow and trust? Him. Are there people in authority, in structures? Of course there are. But when people start flaunting their authority over those under them, we're seeing how stuff works in the world's kingdoms. Hey, I'm not here to throw rocks at structures in our world. I just want to understand how they work because Jesus is going to compare his kingdom to kingdoms in this world. He goes on in verse 26, but among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Well, that's no fun. Isn't the whole point getting to tell other people what to do? It is in the world. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't tell us we're not allowed to want to be a leader. We're not allowed to want to be first. He doesn't say that. He just says, you want to be a leader? Great. You are now everyone's servant. You want to be first? Great. You are now a slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And you think about the time Jesus spent on earth and the things that he did for people and the choices that he helped people with and the love that he showed people. Specifically, and understand how I'm saying this, but specifically the people who didn't deserve it. Jesus said, if you want to be a leader in my kingdom, that's great. But understand, I didn't even come here to be served. Don't think you're going to be served. The kingdom of heaven is a different kind of kingdom. The kingdom of heaven does not have room for selfish ambition. The kingdom of heaven, there is no benefit to collecting or attaining more stuff. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no desire for exerting power to use or hurt those in that kingdom. It's exactly the opposite. We've read for almost three years now how the spiritual gifts that God has given us, that the Holy Spirit has imparted to us, are not for our benefit. They're for the benefit of the body of Christ around us. The blessings that we're given are not for our benefit. They're for the benefit of those around us. And it doesn't make sense if you're thinking like the world's kingdom. Because everything in our world is about me. Even conversations 
need to be about me. And when I've said everything I can think of about me, what do you think about me? (laughs) Everything in this world is about stuff for me. Everything in this world is about how you treat me. We've all been in restaurants where the food was very good, but the service stunk. What does that mean? We weren't treated the way we wanted to be treated. Am I making excuses about poor service in restaurants? You know me, I'm not. But what does that feed into? And Jesus is simply saying, I know that's the way everything else works, but my kingdom is different. My kingdom doesn't work that way. In fact, the more you learn about my kingdom, the more backwards you're going to see it seems. But if Jesus' kingdom seems backwards to us, it's simply because our heads are still in the world's kingdom. I didn't go to my reunion last night because I wanted to do stuff. I knew that I wouldn't be doing stuff. I thought. But I got there, and one of my best friends for almost 50 years now, because we've been friends since we were in junior high, was kind of organizing it. And surprisingly, in a large event with a bunch of people that all decided to show up at the last minute, there were things that needed help being done. Well, I have a little bit of experience with events. And so I said, Gary, just tell me what you need me to do. And he said, okay, and listed some things that needed to be done. I said, I can do that. And then he stopped and he stuck his hand out. And I just naturally, if you stick your hand out, it's a response. I can't help it. But what about COVID? I still can't help it. (laughs) If you stick your hand out, I'm going to reach out and shake your hand. And he says, would you say grace and open the event right before we eat? And I said, Gary, I did not come here to stand up in front of all these people and pray. But he says, I know. So I said, of course. Now see, I haven't talked to most of these people in 40 years. All they, if they remember me, all they remember is the guy who could make fun of people and tell dirty jokes. That's who they know. And that's the guy that's going to stand up and pray? But in my head, I reminded myself, you're here to serve, buddy. What needs to be done, do it. If there's something going on and you can help, you help. If for some reason you can't help, you find somebody who can help. You don't walk around complaining about stuff that wasn't done right when you haven't done anything. Which means, I'm sorry, but you don't get to complain about stuff that goes on at church if you're not part of the church. I don't care. (laughs) There are so many people in our church family who will do anything. I love hearing people say, I don't know how to do that, but I'll learn. Rhonda says things like, you know how to refinish furniture? They're like, nope. Tell me what to do. She's got high school kids all over the place who, I don't get this, Charles, you wouldn't get this, but they've never seen a piece of sandpaper they don't know what end of the screwdriver does the work. (laughs) They didn't have a dad like you had and a dad like I had. 
and Rhonda teaches them. And then I love watching them have fun with the new kids that come in who don't know what end of the screwdriver to use. And all of a sudden, they're talking like lifelong contractors. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know how to use that? Let's see, you want to be a leader in Jesus' kingdom? Help. Serve. I learned a long time ago, there is no job in the church beneath me. I've joked for years about how the only thing around here I haven't done was work in the nursery. And I finally quit that because I thought, it's almost like I'm daring God. <laughs> but Jesus' kingdom is backwards. You don't get in Jesus' kingdom to be served. He didn't get in Jesus' kingdom to be served. Jesus' kingdom doesn't exist because he owns everything and it's all for what he wants. He does, and it is. But when's the last time he did that to you? If we understand what's going right, it is an unspeakable privilege for God to use us to do something. You mean to tell me that God, who spoke the universe into being, wants to use me to touch someone's heart? Oh my gosh! But our heads are in the kingdoms that exist around us. And the Apostle Paul told us what we were going to need to do. Renew our minds. Because the kingdom of God is not just fancy talk. It is living by God's power. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And Father, as much as we look at with astonishment what your people did in the Old Testament. And we would love to think that we would never do anything like that. The truth is, each one of us has at some point done exactly that. But Father, we know we were wrong. And we know that you are gracious and merciful and have invited us to be part of your kingdom. And Father, personally, that's where I want to live and that's where I want to live the rest of my life. So as we go through this new week, whatever you have for us to do, we thank you for using us. We thank you for protecting us and for keeping us and helping us understand that you really are a good father. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.